If it's Wednesday, record gas prices and soaring inflation meet the biggest hike in interest rates in nearly 30 years as the Federal Reserve scrambles to try to get control of inflation. And the White House pushes oil companies to ramp up production of gas quickly. Plus, Trump's grip on the Republican Party following another round of primaries. Maybe it's a little bit stronger. A new slate of winners and losers means new insights into both parties' paths in November. We'll break down the latest lessons from last night's election results from coast to coast. And later, the January 6th committee zeroes in on the former president's inaction during the insurrection. We've also got new details on what to expect in tomorrow's hearing, featuring our key advisor to former Vice President Mike Pence. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd, and we begin this hour with the breaking economic news that policymakers in Washington are scrambling to address inflation, which may be the biggest political threat to President Biden and the Democrats, at least in the short term. Right now, the Federal Reserve is still trying to play catch up. This afternoon, raise interest rates three quarters of a percentage point. It's the single largest increase in interest rates in 28 years, as the prices Americans are paying for everything from gas to groceries continues to soar. The Fed chair, Jerome Powell, just finished answering reporter questions after announcing the rate hike. He told reporters that additional rate hikes of this magnitude were possible as his agency tries to bring costs down without, they think, throwing the U.S. into an economic recession. We at the Fed understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. We're strongly committed to bringing inflation back down and we're moving expeditiously to do so. We anticipate that ongoing rate increases will be appropriate. The pace of those changes will continue to depend on the incoming data and the evolving outlook for the economy. So the Fed's announcement comes as gas prices remain above $5 a gallon nationwide, according to AAA. And in a letter to major oil refinery companies, President Biden is now demanding they take immediate actions to ramp up supply, writing, I understand that many factors contributed to the business decisions to reduce refinery capacity, which occurred before I took office. But at a time of war, refinery profit margins well above normal being passed directly onto American families are not acceptable. On Wall Street, the markets were not spooked by the Fed's announcements. In some ways, they kind of embraced it, it appears. All three major indexes closed up on the day. Of course, it was so down the last two days. Maybe there was no place up to go but up. Meanwhile, Powell suggested that the path to tame inflation is going to be long and the road is going to be winding. We're not going to declare victory until we see uh, a series of these, you know, really see convincing evidence, compelling evidence that inflation is coming down. And th that's what I mean by that's what it would take for us to say, OK, we think uh, we think this is this job is done. I think we're going to be careful about uh, about declaring victory. So let's dig into all of this, what it means, what it means for you. I'm joined on set by the NBC News senior business analyst, Stephanie Rule. I'm also joined by CNBC's senior White House correspondent, Kayla Tausche. And Betsy Stevenson is a former White House economic advisor in the Obama administration. Kayla, let me start with you in the action aspect of things. This, the president, he knew the Fed, the Fed rate was coming today, so... The Fed increase was coming. There wanted to be this perception, I think, of a one-two punch that everybody's trying to get their hands uh, around, their arms around this inflation issue. This letter to refinery companies, what's realistic in the ask that the White House made? Well, they want the refiners to do more. The problem, Chuck, is that there's not that much more to do. Refiners are already operating at about 94 percent capacity, and a lot of those refineries have started moving toward biofuels because they see the writing on the wall. They see where the economy is moving in the future. The president wants to appear to be trying to do all he can, and certainly there has been engagement here at the White House behind the scenes. Top economic officials hosted the CEOs of Exxon and Chevron last week. I'm told those discussions were relatively diplomatic, but there there were no policy outcomes that were decided. There were no decisions about how to move forward that were being made. A lot of these industry officials say that, you know, while they understand that the White House needs to find a boogeyman, that their hands are tied, that ultimately they answer to their shareholders, and they have to invest based on where they believe the economy is going, and without the blessing from the Biden administration that they're going to be endorsing fossil fuels and hydrocarbons for the long haul, it's hard for them to justify investing. Kayla, I have to follow up there. I think it's notable that the White House met with those CEOs last week and they didn't try to make a big deal out of it at the time last week. 
that tells me they are doing a little diplomacy. Well, what you should know, Chuck, is that actually it was the companies who requested these meetings. Uh, it was the CEO of Exxon and the CEO of Chevron who were here in Washington, D.C. for industry meetings, and they wanted an audience with the White House. They wanted to share some of their ideas about what they felt could be done, at least rhetorically, because the industry and the White House have been fundamentally at odds. The administration wants results now. The industry wants uh, some promises for the future. Anyway, it's notable I mean, now that this letter was directed at the refinery companies. Uh, and perhaps left some of those big names off. Stephanie, let's talk much bigger picture here. Three quarters of a point. I was seeing one uh, economic analyst who looked at this and said, all right, the Fed, is, it, it, the Fed now realizes a recession is coming unless some dramatic efforts are made. And this is a pretty dramatic step. Listen, it's a huge issue. And we can all sit here and say, why didn't they do this when? We can say that. We're but we now. do have to remember... When the Fed flooded the system with money and dropped rates to zero, we were at the worst point of COVID. No one was planning on that. And then nine months ago when they were saying, oh, this is short term, it's transitory, that was a mistake. But again, nobody was planning that Russia would invade Ukraine. No one thought that China would shut down. So when you talk about politics here, and obviously inflation is a huge issue for the American people, and Republicans are pushing to make this the number one issue for people at the polls, which it might be, come November, it doesn't matter who's in office. The war is not going to be over. These supply chain issues won't be completely cleared up, and we're going to be living in this inflationary environment for a while. Betsy Stevenson, are we going to continue to have a hot labor market, or how does this end up slowing the labor market? Well, I mean, this is the balancing act that the Fed's trying to... Uh, to achieve. And they admitted today that it's going to be incredibly hard for them to get it right. They actually need to slow the economy. The whole point of raising rates today is we need to get demand down. That's what the Fed does is you reduce demand and that brings pressure on prices down. But if you reduce demand too much, then businesses are like, hey, where are my customers? They're not here. I lay off my employees. That's sort of the fundamental problem. They want to bring down demand, the Goldilocks amount, the amount that is enough that you can hang on to the employees you have, that we're not driving businesses out of business, that we don't spark a recession. But they've got to bring demand down enough that you know, we don't have this pressure on prices. And what they're basically saying is some of this is out of their hands at this point. You know, what's going to happen globally? Right. You know, the thing that's slowing global growth is the war in Ukraine. It's not, you know, monetary policy. And there's not that much they can do about that. Betsy, what about this? I mean, on the list of things that can have some impact, not a huge amount, that is within Biden's uh, wheelhouse, it would be getting rid of some tariffs on China. Thoughts? I'd do that right away. I mean, the thing is, is that we know that tariffs lead to higher prices. And right now we need any relief on prices we can get because the only thing that the only other sort of set of tools we have is to uh, raise rates on people so that they want to spend less. So businesses want to spend less. So we get less demand or sort of take money away from people by uh, raising taxes on the fiscal policy side. That, those are sort of the only tools unless you can directly bring down prices by something like cutting tariffs. So I would absolutely recommend that the Biden administration go after that approach. And then the other thing they're doing is trying to increase the supply right. of gas because the gas prices are killing people. And the only way we're going to see gas prices come down is if we see more gas come online. This so, break, go ahead. Sam. You know, this speaks to the same issue. Some people say, wait, lift these tariffs. That's not what we want to do big picture. China's not our friend. We're hearing the same thing about Biden's planned visit to Saudi Arabia next month, which is infuriating people. But remember, you can't just say, hey, West Texas, start pumping. We're not in a position to do that. Saudi Arabia is. And it doesn't change Biden's opinion or point of view yeah. on Saudi Arabia. But we got to get those gas prices down. And that's what he's going to address. But Kayla, really? you tell me, uh, what's Saudi Arabia really going to be willing to do? They, they haven't been willing to, to do this yet. They haven't been. What, what do they want? Um, they're not going to get uh, what I think what MBS wants. But is there something else they can get from us that would actually have them turn the spigot on to a point? I mean, I, I would think providing the defense that we provide them should have been enough. But that's obviously not where we are. 
Well, and they want that pipeline to continue, Chuck, and certainly they want the president of the United States to legitimize the crown prince and the, the kingdom by appearing uh, side by side when he goes there in just about a month. I'm told by foreign policy experts and administration officials behind the scenes that President Biden would not agree to this trip if there were not a deliverable to come out of it. And we've seen, you know, with this administration, oftentimes they wait until the 11th hour until mm -hmm. it's fully wrapped up with a bow to say what that is. But as of this week, they have not been able to actually articulate what it is that's going to come out of this trip. Let's go back to the Fed here, Stephanie. And that is, so we're going to have, we're, we've had all this excess money. One of the concerns I have is, and I know you've talked about it a little bit, the free money that was out there for so long. A lot of it. Wasn't just came from directly from the government. It was also free money to borrow. And a lot of it went into this speculative crypto business. Sure did. Um, how much is crypto, could crypto be responsible for dragging us into a recession? It can definitely hurt us in a big way. However, unlike the subprime crisis, which really became an issue and the government said, we're accountable to all these people. We're going to have to find a way to help them and make them whole. That's not going to be the case in crypto. Right? Talk to anyone who is in the crypto space. Crypto is all about decentralization. Don't mm -hmm. tread on me. I don't want the government near me. So while you are seeing you know, crypto investors lose their shirts. Isn't this really why the markets are so volatile right now? The stock It's mostly a whole bunch of crypto investors who are panicked and have to like pay off their debt. It, it's absolutely that. But also remember, when rates are at zero, there is nowhere for you to invest your money except the stock market. Certainly don't go look uh, in your savings account. So when rates go up, suddenly stocks aren't the only game in town. But really, when you think about the explosion of crypto and how much those men, I was going to say guys, and women have lost, they're definitely muddying the waters. But guess what? Like you invested in crypto, buyer beware. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Betsy, what about the housing market here? Because and I, I had a conversation with somebody at the Fed who, who said, you know, we're in this weird period as well that Normally, this rise in interest rates would slow down the housing market, but we have such a supply issue that we're likely not to see prices drop in housing. We just won't see them increase. What's this mean for somebody looking for a home right now? Um, well, I mean, if you're looking for a home, you're, you know, a regular person, you're taking out a mortgage. So sure, prices of the house might not go up. Maybe prices of the houses even goes down a little bit, but what you're going to be paying has gone up because the interest on your mortgage has gone up. So I don't think there's any real solutions for feeling the pinch on, uh, on, per on people who are trying to get into the market right now. And I think the bigger problem that, you know, the Fed realizes is we're going to see the rental rates continue to flow in uh, raising uh, inflation for many months to come because you know we that stuff doesn't get baked into our inflation rates until somebody's lease renews. Um, so we know that new leases rents are way up, and yeah. so we've got some more you know shelter inflation priced in. Um, you know a lot of the the increase in housing prices has been driven by changes in the labor market work from home, being able to work remotely, wanting to move to where you have family members who can help provide care or where you can provide care for family members. Um, recent research showed that contributed roughly half of the increase in housing prices. So I think a big question for housing is not just what's the Fed going to do, but what are employers going to do? Are right. they going to make you move back into the office or not? Um, because there's a lot of turmoil in housing markets. It's being driven by that relocation and, and shift in preferences. And Betsy, is there any, to me, the only thing Congress could do so substantively is actually deal with immigration, which is something they won't do in order to tackle inflation. Is there anything else Congress could do other than stop spending money for a period of time? Well, I mean, on the housing front, they could certainly try to actually, that's a place where they could spend some money. Let's build some housing. Uh, sure. Let's try to increase the supply. Uh, you're absolutely right to to raise the immigration point. And I'm just going to say, I, don't, I, I disagree with you a little bit. I think that they have been doing something about immigration. It's been small. It's been sort of under the radar, but they've been trying to increase the number of people who could come through on, you know, H-2B visas. Those are those temporary summer visas. The J-1, they're trying to get those summer visas up because we are short a lot of yep. immigrant workers, and that's been putting a lot of pressure in the labor market. We've seen a big increase in the last few months, and they're going to need to have that increase continue right. for the next few months. Because the biggest problem for the Fed right now is inflation has spilled into services, and that is going to be driven by tight labor markets. So yep. they've got to get inflation down in services, and the only way to do that is going to be to get workers in. No, politically, an anti-immigration stance is actually an anti-lowering inflation stance, but... 
I don't think there's a political consultant that's figured that out yet. And he's Stephanie Rule, Kayla Tausche, Betsy Stevenson. Thank you for getting us started here. We do have some breaking news from the government, by the way. This afternoon, the FDA's advisory panel officially approved vaccines for children under the age of five. The outside group gave the green light to both the Moderna two-shot vaccine regimen, Pfizer's three-shot regimen for the youngest children. There are roughly 18 million infants, toddlers, and preschoolers in this country who will now be able to be vaccinated. Everything goes as planned. Shots should be available to be going into the little arms as early as next week. Apparently, 49 states, I believe, have asked for this. Only the state of Florida is not going to officially recommend it. Coming up, soaring prices and mounting frustration within the White House. Who's responsible for the gas price mess plaguing consumers nationwide? We're going to take a deeper dive with an expert on the oil industry right after the break. And later, in another round of primaries, another round of winners and losers. We're on the ground in South Carolina and Nevada. Breaking down last night's election results and where both covered parties go from here. Watch Meet the Press now. Welcome back. While the Federal Reserve tries to reel in rising inflation, Americans continue to see prices rising at the pump. The national average for gas today continues to sit at around $5 a gallon. So we wanted to understand the pricing of gas a little bit better here. So we'll more on why, why that is and what can be done. I'm joined now by Daniel Jurgen. He's vice chair of the S&P Global. He's also author of The New Map, Energy Climate, and The Clash of Nations, now out in a newly released and updated paperback edition. Bottom line is, if you want to understand these oil markets, there's only one guy to talk to, and it's Daniel Jurgen. Mr. Jurgen, I want to start with what may seem like a simple question with a very complicated answer. But I'm going to channel a friend of mine who said, this is not the first time the price of oil, a barrel of oil, has been more than $100 over the last 15 years. In fact, it's happened multiple times. But it is the first time that the price of gas has gone over $5. Explain that disconnect to the average viewer here. What's happening, Chuck, is a global dislocation in the oil market that actually began before the uh, Ukraine war, but has been made much worse by the Ukraine war. So uh, in so many different parts of the world, uh, the whole system, and it's a global system. I mean, the Northeast of the United States is supplied with gasoline from Europe. Europe's supplied with diesel from uh, Russia. That whole system's broken down. Uh, so it's all of these things have come together, and refiners have been pushed to produce biofuels. Now they've said produce more gasoline. So uh, we're in a tight spot. The other issue appears to be during the pandemic, when there was a glut, nobody was driving. Um, refineries basically stopped refining, right? They, they had such a large inventory. What is the, is there a lesson to be learned going forward that could prevent this kind of price whiplash that we faced over the last six weeks? I think you're right. You're absolutely right to focus in on the pandemic because demand collapsed. Uh, you know, these companies lost an enormous amount of money and certainly shut down marginal refineries for that. I think, you know, I think the lesson here is, uh, is keeping your eye on resilience and not forgetting about energy security. And we forgot about energy security because we went from importing 60 percent of our oil to being energy independent and just assumed everything would take care of itself. But if you suddenly say we're not going to import 800,000 barrels a day of Russian oil, which we did uh, a couple, you know, a couple months ago when the war started, uh, that's going to impact the whole system. So I think there's a... In all these previous crises, there's been a dialogue between government and, and industry. It isn't happening this time. And you need it because you need to be talking to the people who daily have to manage this logistical system and move these supplies around the world and around the country. All right. We know politics is getting in the way. We know the Democrats are looking for a boogeyman here in the oil companies. Are these hits on the oil companies fair? Where, how well, about this? Is, What's fair of these hits? Well, let me say, well, I think what's fair is to say we're in the political panic season right now, and therefore you get these uh, sound bites, which actually solve nothing. But let me just give you one example. And to borrow a word that you used in the last segment, Chuck, you used the word weird. What's really weird is to say the oil industry, the domestic oil industry isn't producing. Yet, according to the U.S. government itself, U.S. oil production is going to go up almost a million barrels a day this year, which is more than the new production in all the rest of the world. So. What do you mean they're not producing? Another weird thing is talking to all these other countries like Venezuela, but maybe talk to the domestic industry and collectively try and solve the problems and try, by the way, to solve the supply chain problems that are affecting the operations of the industry just as they are the rest of the economy. Give me, a, give me an example here. Look, in the, 
in the president's letter, it was interesting to me. You know, some people say the rhetoric was hot. I actually thought it was pretty mild. And he's not, they're not ready with sticks yet. It does seem as if they're trying, like, what can the government do to help incentivize uh, expanding the capacity at refineries? Well, I mean, obviously, a lot of it would be regulations to make it more feasible. A lot of refineries have shut down because the regulatory costs have gone up. I think that the, um, you know, the letter, I mean, if there was Chuck Todd refinery, you'd be producing every barrel of gasoline you could right now. Right. So the notion that they'd be holding back just doesn't doesn't make economic sense at all. I, I think it's uh, I think this adversary nature is not helping solving the problem that Americans are feeling at the pump. And, you know, it goes back to we're in a political season where uh, it's easier to have sound bites than to actually have sound policy. In uh, our strategic oil reserve, do we should we have a strategic essentially post refined oil reserve? Do we need to keep well, we have, more of this? Is there a, a way we could have kept, you know, prices from totally getting out of hand here? Yeah, I think that uh, is a very reasonable question. And we do have one, I believe, in the Northeast to refine products, but it's not very big. Uh, I think it's harder to store refined products for a long time. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think you need to build resilience. That's an example of resilience uh, in the system. Uh, rather than, you know, kind of playing catch up what we're trying to do right now. Uh, it's tough because, you know, the president, as you said, is going to go to Saudi Arabia. It's very hard to believe that the subject of oil will not come up directly or indirectly. And we'll probably get some kind of positive signal coming out of that, which may be good for the market. Of course, the oil market's also responding to like what the Fed is, is doing and so forth. But the thing is, Chuck, it's really tight right now. Uh, Iran's not coming back in the market because there's not going to be a nuclear deal. There's not vast amounts of un, uh, oil waiting to be produced in Saudi Arabia. There's some. Uh, and of course, the ban on Russian production is happening. So it's, it is really a very difficult problem. And it's, you know, this is an emergency and it has to be managed as an emergency. I don't see how using the Defense Production Act you know, the government's not going to build a refinery. And by the way, it'll take five years to get it permitted. So, you know, you have to deal with what you have now. What's real? When is it? When should we expect the price of gas to drop below four again? Well, I think uh, if you can just tell me when the Fed's impact will have on the economy, because I think that the biggest impact will be coming from a slow e slower economy, which will then affect uh, gasoline demand. Yeah. But, you know, it's I mean, the, the wild card here is still what's happening with, with Russia and Ukraine and how that's affect dislocating the whole market. But even before we went into this crisis, it was uh, a difficult situation. And by the way, I hate to be raise another issue. If China finally comes out of COVID yeah. and its demand goes up, that's going to add to the pressure. So it's a tough time and we're not that far from an election, but it'd still be better to, you know, try and get beyond sound bites. Yeah. And as Stephanie and I were just talking, there's no sign that people are going to stop spending money this summer. Demand is still up to travel. And it sounds like we may be dealing with these high gas prices, at least uh, through uh, the summer. Daniel Jurgen, as I said at the start, I can't think of anybody better or smarter to talk about this with. So thank you. Thank you. Up next, two Republican members of Congress who Trump deemed disloyal. They were on the ballot last night. One survived, one didn't. What did we learn? More results and what they mean for Trump's influence on the GOP after the break. You're watching Meet the Press. Welcome back. This June, if it's Wednesday, it means somebody voted somewhere yesterday. We got results from some key primary races on the GOP side of things in South Carolina and Nevada. It's a couple of states we're watching for clues to see how much appetite primary voters have for Trump-backed candidates and critics. Let's start in South Carolina's 7th Congressional District. The incumbent there, Congressman Tom Rice, one of the 10 Republicans to back Trump's 2021 impeachment. First one on the ballot in front of voters so far this year. He got blown out by his Trump-backed opponent, Russell Fry. Didn't even get a runoff out of this. Rice remained a critic of the former president right through Election Day, perhaps hoping Democrats would show up into the primary. He mused that voting his conscience on impeachment may cost him his job, and, well, it did. A little, a little further down the coast, in a slightly different congressional district, Congresswoman Nancy Mace held on against another Trump-backed challenger. Mace had spoken out against Trump's conduct in 2021, but she never voted for impeachment and became outright as hostile towards the former president 
perhaps as the impeach voters did. In addition to running in a more moderate district, thank you, Charleston, if you will, for her, that's what may have kept her from Tom Rice's fate. Over in Nevada, the Trump-endorsed candidates swept the high-profile statewide Republican primaries. Joe Lombardo winning the gubernatorial contest. Trump sort of latched onto that after the fact. Adam Laxalt was an early uh, endorsee of Trump's. Uh, he won the Senate race. Jim Marchant taking the Secretary of State nomination. Trump's nod does go a long way in fields that lack a lot of serious candidates. So both Laxalt and Marchant are outspoken supporters of that false claim that Trump won the state of Nevada in 2020. And Marchant's nomination means he's one election away from running Nevada's elections in 2024. So let's start out east and then we'll go west. we got Vaughn Hilliard on the ground in Charleston, South Carolina. Guad Venegas is in Reno, Forest, Washoe County, one of our Meet the Press uh, county to counties there. Vaughn, let me start with you. Uh, how's Rice feeling this morning? We're surprised we don't have a runoff. I think we thought we'd have a runoff there. Right. He only brought in 25 percent of the vote after a decade in Congress in a district in which he is well known. Twenty five percent of mm. the vote here. You know, I think it's Chuck. We've been for seven years now trying to figure out uh, and Republican lawmakers have been trying to figure out uh, just how sharp that barbed wire fence that they try to walk on is and how far they can step away from Donald Trump to the point that re voters ultimately revolt against them. When we look at the likes of, you know, Jeff Flakes, of Bob Corkers of years past, they decided to step away, uh, not even run for re-election. And that's why these primaries over the last months, and especially those coming up in the next two, are so intriguing. Because we're really seeing for the first time these uh, individuals in the GOP, who Donald Trump frankly despises, uh, be challenged by uh, candidates uh, from the party that he has endorsed. And we saw what happened to Tom Rice, only 25 percent of support. But that's where Nancy Mace is sort of this intriguing figure. She spoke out so loudly, talking with you 11 days after the insurrection, coming on Meet the Press and talking about how she was going to be the new voice for a rebuilt Republican Party. But then suddenly she went silent this last year and ultimately stopped criticizing Donald Trump and, if anything, started praising again uh, the years of his administration. And I think that's where it hits at the Nancy Mace and these Republicans. To what extent are they able to sort of softly embrace while also uh, trying to stick to somewhat of who they are? Take a listen when I was asking her last night after her win what this says about her future in this party, Trump's Republican Party today. Donald Trump tried to oust you from the Republican Party. What is your message to Donald Trump now? My message is the same to him as it is to anybody else on either side of the aisle. I am more willing to work with anyone who's willing to work with me. Full stop. What role will you play in the Republican Party going forward? I'm going to play as much of a role as I can as I have so far. I am not unaccustomed to being called to the principal's office, and sometimes it's the vice principal's office. But I work really hard to represent the values of my district. I bring that voice to Washington, and that's why you saw us get elected and have a great win tonight. Now, we saw what happened with Tom Rice here. Now, over the next two months, we're going to be looking at Dan Newhouse, Jamie Herrera Butler, Peter Meyer in Michigan, right. and Liz Cheney in Wyoming. Those are four GOP members who voted to impeach him who are trying to hold on to their seats against Trump endorsed primary challengers. Yeah, Michigan and Washington State, uh, you feel like there's a boxer's chance. Wyoming, we shall see. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you. Let's go over to Guad. And Guad, I think the story really is this Republican ticket. And we're going to get more into it later, but it is. It's a pretty Trumpy ticket here in a pretty important battleground state. Uh, correct, Chuck. But they're very different candidates. So Trump endorsed both Lombardo and Adam Laxalt, but the messaging to the voters is different. Adam Laxalt has been a supporter. There was election fraud. Adam Laxalt has played into the politics of the MAGA agenda. So his voters are Trump supporters who think there was election fraud, and it's much more aggressive against Democrats. If you go to any Adam Laxalt event, you will hear attacks on Catherine Cortez Masto, attacks on President Biden. This morning, they put out an ad saying that Catherine Cortez Masto is responsible for inflation, for crime, and for high gas prices. Meanwhile, Joe Lombardo, also endorsed by Trump, has a more moderate message. He's been speaking to all of the voters in Nevada. You can understand that during the primaries, both of them wanted to be the nominated Republicans, but Joe Lombardo's message 
does resonate with some nonpartisan voters. He was talking about the response during the pandemic by the current incumbent governor, uh, Steve Sisolak. He was talking about the businesses that were affected, parents who couldn't send their kids to school fast enough. So there's a lot more voters who haven't decided that can relate to someone like Joe Lombardo, but it's going to be difficult for someone like Adam Laxalt, who's also endorsed by Ron DeSantis, to win over all of these nonpartisan voters, especially in places like Washoe County, where we've been reporting for months. The conversations, Chuck, that we've had with the nonpartisan voters, one third of the voters here that are very important, is that they don't want to see someone that's going to divide the country. They were very upset when the politics were divided, when Donald Trump was dividing the country. They made point of the fact that Donald Trump lost here in the last election, and they said, look, we don't want to vote, and this is what most of them have told me, we don't want to vote for someone who's Democrat or Republican. We just want to vote for someone who's going to work across the aisle, someone who's going to unite the country and who will represent the things that are important to us here in Nevada. So for Adam Laxalt, the way he's been speaking to his Republican voters, it might be a little difficult to win those nonpartisan voters. But when you think of the ticket, someone like Joe Lombardo could win over some of these right. voters. And if a voter is voting down the ticket, yeah. all Republican, then maybe they would also vote for someone like Adam Laxalt. Well, Glad, you're putting the right focus. Remember, voters care more, much more usually about their governor's race than they do their Senate race, even though we in Washington. So much care for that. But also remember, when the country gets a cold economically, Nevada gets the flu. Glad, uh, thanks very much. Still ahead, more aids coming to Ukraine. Is it coming in time? The U.S. announces yet more security assistance. It's another billion dollars. Russian forces have been unleashing just violent attacks in the East. We'll have more on that story from Key next. You're watching Meet the President. Welcome back. Let's turn now to the war in Ukraine. As Russian forces continue to intensify their attack in eastern Ukraine, the U.S. is now sending some more aid to arm the Ukrainian military. As you know, President Biden has a huge, nearly $40 billion piggy bank to pick from. He announced another billion dollars in security assistance this morning. After talking to President Zelensky, he also announced an additional $225 million in humanitarian assistance. All of this money is coming from that previous funding. That's that $40 billion aid package that the Senate passed back in May. So when you hear these announcements, this is an additional money. This is all part of that pot of money that now the president semi-unilaterally can decide how to spend on Ukraine. It's for Ukraine, but how to do it. Now, President Zelensky is continuing to call for modern missile defense systems from the West. And Ukraine's deputy minister of defense said yesterday, Ukraine has only received 10% of the weapons that they have requested. At the White House briefing last hour, the NSC's new communication coordinator, John Kirby, who was once at the Pentagon, said the White House could not confirm reports that two Americans were captured in Ukraine, by the way. Kirby said they were monitoring that situation. NBC News has also not confirmed those reports. Meanwhile, heavy fighting continues in Ukraine's eastern Donbas region, despite strong Ukrainian resistance. A regional governor says Russian forces now control 80 percent of a key city in the region. For an update on where things stand from the perspective of the Ukrainian government, uh, we've got Ali Aruzi. He is in Kiev. Ali, there doesn't seem to be a lot of good news for President Zelensky to report in his nightly address these days. W what is happening in the east? And is this a can you still characterize it as a standoff or uh, is Ukraine starting to uh, lose some territory? Hey, Chuck, they, they are unfortunately starting to lose territory. Look, the Russians are in control of about uh, 70 or 80 percent of Severodonetsk, which is the capital of the Luhansk area. And the, Rus and the Ukrainian troops are getting pushed further and further back into very small pockets of control. That city is essentially now being cut off from the rest of Ukraine. There were three bridges connecting Severodonetsk with Lysychansk, its twin city across the river. Uh, they've all been destroyed by the Russians. Uh, there's a handful of Ukrainians fighting there, and they're running out of ammo. So this aid can't come in soon enough. But the Ukrainians are saying that, listen, we're only getting this aid in small doses. It's barely enough to allow us to defend ourselves let alone uh, launch some sort of tangible attack against the Russians. So, uh, so it's a really fierce battle that they're putting up there. And of course, Chuck, the fear is that if the Russians take Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, it's, it's a twin town, the terrain then becomes very flat beyond that. It becomes very easy for the Russian tanks to roll westward. And they could then use that whole eastern front as a launching pad for further attacks across the country. So it's a pivotal moment right now 
on the Eastern Front. And frankly, the Ukrainians are getting battered there because they don't have enough uh, ammo or enough forces to be able to bring in because of the sheer mass of the Russian army. Ali, really quickly, is the issue us not getting weapons there fast enough or is the issue training on the weapons we're trying to send them? It's both, Chuck. I mean, it takes about two to three weeks to get trained on these uh, advanced rocket systems. They have to go out of the country usually to get trained on them. So they're not getting in the, on the battlefield in time. And they're just not getting enough weapons from the West. They're saying that they're getting drip feeding weapons. You mentioned they're getting 10 percent of what they need. So they essentially need 90 percent more than what they have to uh, stave off this uh, R Russian onslaught. So it's a combination of both. Ali Aruzi in Kiev for us. Ali, as always, sir, thank you, and please keep safe. Quick note here in this country before we take a break. There is a new street sign that was unveiled outside the Saudi embassy here in Washington, D.C. today. Jamal Khashoggi Way was named in honor of the Washington Post journalist and critic of the Saudi government, who was gruesomely murdered in 2018 on the orders of Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The street renaming was officially approved last year in a unanimous vote by the D.C. City Council, and it comes one day after the White House officially announced President Biden will visit Saudi Arabia next month. So the embassy here in America, in Saudi Arabia, its address is now Jamal Fisher. Still ahead, the latest from Capitol Hill ahead of tomorrow's January 6th hearing and its focus on one of the targets of Trump's efforts to subvert the election, his own Vice President Mike Pence. You're watching Meet the President. Welcome back. Let's get right into today's panel. I'm joined by Eugene Daniels, White House correspondent for Politico, co-author of the Playbook newsletter. He's also an MSNBC political analyst. My colleague, Simone Sanders, host of uh, Simone on MSNBC, and Republican strategist Jim Dornan. we got a lot to get to. I want to get to three big topics. we got the primaries last night. Let's start with the Fed, Eugene. It is interesting to me. The White House knew the Fed was going to be the story today, and they, and they try to sort of essentially draft off of it with their own kit on the oil refinery mm -hmm. companies here. They seem to be flailing and trying to do something. They want to look like, hey, we're trying to do something. But it doesn't seem like they know what that something is. That's right. There are a lot of things that this White House is dealing with that are out of their control, right? That's the biggest problem for them. And the economy and inflation, that's one of the aspects that they don't have a lot of control over, especially because this president has wanted to give the Fed their ability to do what they want to do and allow them to do that work. And so, you know, they have this three-part plan that they're talking about. They, you know, the president sending these oil um, letters. But what happened at the very beginning when inflation was becoming a problem is the messaging wasn't great. They were kind of scoffing at it. They said that it was going to be transitory, that it wasn't going to last very long. That obviously has not been the case. And so you have had this transition over and over into new different ways to explain away inflation to the American people. And when you're looking at high gas prices and you're looking um, at high milk and high food and all types of different things, not being able to find formula, people feel like something's wrong. And that's more important. Simone, why does it always feel like the White House is always a day behind? A week behind, whatever it is. They it just just feels that way. Crises, Chuck, it's yeah. just, it's a lot. I mean, coming into this administration, you know, I worked there. I remember our whole thing was we're dealing with four converging crises. Okay, well, four became five, became six, became seven, became eight. Oop, hello, war in Ukraine. So there's a lot happening here. I do think it is important to note that inflation is a global issue that everyone is dealing with, right? Like prices are high in Canada. They're, pri they're high all over the world. But that's not really a great argument to make to voters, right? It's not okay to yeah. tell them that it's high in Canada. So we, this is something that, you know, it, people aren't as understanding. So I, I completely get it, and I think the White House understands it. But to Eugene's point, there is not much that they can do. With what they can do, they are trying, but there's not much to do. All right. Well, one thing they're trying to do, and I'm curious your reaction to this. I'm going to play uh, uh, Tim Kaine, not happy about the Saudi trip, thinks this is a mistake, but it is something they're trying to do, deal with gas prices. Tim Kaine... Uh, uh, told CNN that the, he thought the trip was a bad idea. He thought it was a big mistake. Uh, he'd meet with other uh, members of the Saudi administration. He'd meet with a lot of other people, just not with MBS. Is the, is, is the juice worth the squeeze? I don't know. And, I, I mean, uh, we were just chatting before we came on air talking about Jamal Khashoggi Way and what the, you know, D.C. has done in erecting that, that sign. And I remember at the time how disturbed everyone was, including now President of the United States of America, Joe Biden, by what was developing and what, what we were hearing in Jamal Khashoggi's entire case. Um, 
I, I think it's a calculation. Look, it's a calculation. Obviously, folks inside the White House have determined that the juice is worth the squeeze. They've pushed him hard on They this. have pushed him very hard. I think the pre the, there are many people out there whispering yeah. from, uh, for the president. We have not heard from the president directly on this, that this is not something um, that he thinks is a good idea. So I don't the know. Saudis aren't popular left or right. No, and I, I don't think this is a good idea, especially given the contrast he was presenting, Biden was presenting with the Trump administration when they did essentially nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think this is a bad look. I think it is especially bad look because oil prices are, are you know, that it's not going to, it's not going to affect it. I don't think it's going to affect it. All right, let me ask what's an, your expertise in, in Trump world, or at least in Republican politics world. <laughs> <Not Trump world. laughs> I know. Good luck with that, Chip. Um, what did you learn yesterday between Nancy Mace and Tom Rice, and how does it apply to, say, Peter Meyer? in Michigan, or uh, Jamie Herrera-Butler in okay, Washington so State. Okay, so two totally different districts. Yeah. One very rural, uh, less educated, one much more suburban. And basically, Trump gave uh, the first away when he and, and didn't endorse uh, Sanford, when he endorsed right. Arrington in 2018. Trump's popularity was zero among suburban women. Uh, and I think that that district recognized that. And Nancy's done a good job. So doesn't that mean Peter Meyer has a boxer's chance? Because he's in a district that in theory, looks a lot more like the Nancy Mace district than the Thomas Oh, I, I think Peter Meyer's going to be fine. I do. You do? Yeah. And That's I, a bold I, statement. I, I think that Jamie Herrera is going to be fine. I think that Dan Newman, uh, Dan Newman yeah. is going to be fine. I, Liz, I'm a little worried about. Well, she's in the top. I was just going to say, that's the electorate, Eugene, that looks mm -hmm. the most like Tom Rice. Yeah, no, absolutely. One of the things that was really interesting with Nancy Mace as we moved forward, my family's from Myrtle Beach area. So, okay. you know, when I would go visit my grandmother, we're watching TV and the Tom Rice commercials are coming and coming. And it was clear that you know, he had an uphill battle. And that's what we saw yesterday with Nancy Mace. She decided to kind of waffle on criticizing Trump. Stop doing that. Went in front of Trump Tower, kind of endorsed herself after he endorsed <laughs> endorsed, endorsed her. Say anything, Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's, that's um, what Exactly. That's Gen Xers Exactly. That, and, right. and so, you know, that is what every one of these folks who Donald Trump has put a target on mm -hmm. as he's moved forward have to figure out. And if they decide that they're going to go the Nancy Mace route, it's possible that they might come out with 53.1 to 45.3, right. which we're looking at now. Obviously, Raffensperger can't tell the broader your electorate, mm -hmm. the better shot you have. All right. Let me pause here. I want to bring in Ali Patali to give us Okay, yesterday's hearing that was postponed is not the hearing we're going to have tomorrow. That hearing is going to be next week. So tomorrow's hearing was always going to be the Mike Pence Day. Tell us about Mike Pence Day. That's probably the best shorthand I can come up with, Allie. <laughs> Yeah, I think Mike Pence Day is probably the best shorthand that we should be using, too, because that's what the focus of this is. We just got off a background call with the committee where they laid out for us that there's going to be a few different prongs and a few different ways that they attack this idea of how Mike Pence was pressured, both from the legal standpoint, talking about John Eastman, potentially seeing some of the emails that have been tied up in court, potentially seeing new documents and materials that we haven't yet seen before. Of course, the committee is never forthcoming on these, even when doing background briefings things like that. Nevertheless, they're going to get into the legal detailing of the ways in which the vice president was pressured. And then, of course, there's the entire question of what the conversations were between the VP's office and the Trump White House. There were people in the White House counsel's office saying that these mechanisms that people were trying to use to overturn the election results and supplant the election results could not be done. Nevertheless, we saw that pressure campaign continue. So that's going to be the clear focus there. And then, of course, you have Greg Jacob, who's going to be one of the people testifying in person. He's with the former vice president on the day of January 6th. He wasn't just trading emails with John Eastman, laying blame for this violence at his feet and others for trying to overturn the election results. But at the same time, he's going to be able to illuminate what it was like for Vice President Pence in those moments where he was rushed off the House floor. And of course, people here who were storming the Capitol, chanting things like, hang Mike Pence. Of course, the committee's also teased this little nugget of information that's crucially important about the reaction that Trump allegedly had to Mike Pence mm -hmm. and those threats that he should be hung. It's not clear that that's going to be something they get into tomorrow or if that's something they're going to reserve for the last hearing. But nevertheless, that's one of the key pieces that we're going to be looking out for as they, again, speak to not just what the mindset was of allies right. of the former president, but of Trump himself. And, Ali, I think we also got a little bit of a preview. I mean, I'll tell you one thing this committee's doing is they give us trailers for their, and I guess that's the best way to describe this, Ali. 
Yeah, I think that's probably right because this was one of the key pieces. Part of it they played already from one of the Trump White House counselor lawyers, but this was something more. They played a little bit more of it. Listen. I said to him, are you out of your effing mind? Right? I said, I said, I only want to hear two words coming out of your mouth for now on. Orderly transition. Eventually he said, orderly transition. I said, good, John. Now I'm going to give you the best free legal advice you're ever getting in your life. Get a great effing criminal defense lawyer. You're going to need it. So. Yep. Hirschman there, you know, picking up out of that, saying that in real time, he yeah. thought that something criminal could have been going on. It's not just the committee saying it now. That's conversation that he was having in real time the day after January 6th. All right, Ali Vitale, uh, with that preview for us. Ali, thank you. Jim Dornan, we brought up Tom Rice earlier today. Tom Rice is always the example I use of, of like, that was the, where did he come from? Meaning, during the impeachment, you, you know, we were surprised. Oh, that's a surprise. Dan Newman, I think, was another one. I feel like what what are the chances that we'll have after everybody sees this Pence pressure campaign? Um, do you think we have a couple more that say, you know what, I'm off the Trump train, that it pushes them publicly, a la a Tom Rice? I think probably they were there, if they were there already or getting ready to go, nobody on either side is going to be convinced the other way. One side's going to be supportive, one side's mm -hmm. going to be against them. It's the middle that this is geared towards. And I think the middle, if, I, if I'm hearing right about different focus groups that are being yeah. done out there by different pollsters, it's Indies are not liking what they're hearing on this right now. And so, um, and that's the problem with Trump. He doesn't understand that his base has to go far yeah. beyond 35 percent in order to win. And so, I, I, again, I think maybe one or two or three yeah. But only if they've already kind of been there already. Yeah, this I, is an important yeah. point because um, you heard the White House and a lot of Democrats start talking about ultra MAGA, mm -hmm. and I laughed. But uh, <laughs> there is polling to support it, and it all comes down to the Indies. Um, they don't like extremism. You know, it's extreme talking about jailing women for getting <clears throat> an abortion, jailing doctors. It's extreme to talk about pressuring the former vice president of the United States of America to overturn an election when everyone who worked for uh, not everyone, but a number of high-ranking people who worked for the former president said there is no there there. This extre the extremism is the point. And I, I think it's really important to note that the threat to our democracy is ongoing. You know, you saw one of the top two leading contenders in Michigan for the gubernatorial race on the Republican side. He was arrested. The FBI raided his home uh, because might he was essentially waving people. Uh, <laughs> might help him in that primary, right? But then again, was he one of the folks that yeah. didn't get his signatures right? Okay, no, was he's one that did. No, he That's did. my point. He did. He did. That's my point. Eugene, I think, look, I, I have not, I do not think the midterm elections are a measure of success or failure of these hearings. To me, it really is how influential is Donald Trump in 18 months. Yeah. To me, tells me how successful. What are you hearing from Republicans about what? This committee, I think, has already produced more than some expected. Yeah. I think even the ones that were there and watched all this and pay as much attention as we do, the nerds, they are just as concerned. They're, they are shocked hearing that. Seeing Bill Barr, um, we saw, we heard him say that he told Donald Trump that this was BS, um, but hearing him, see, watching him say that on television is a different thing. Hearing what we just saw from um, a lawyer talking to Eastman or what he told Eastman around those days, that is different. And I think when you, some of the folks I'm talking to, especially the Republicans, they are saying, this is a commercial for Ron DeSantis. That is something that I got Did you get the same thing? Yeah, Everyone's which is like, <laughs> the only winner here is Ron DeSantis. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That Because he has kind of the same, you know, je ne sais quoi that, you know, Trump has and the way that he's able to talk about to people, but he doesn't have all of this. If you, know, you like to own the libs it. without the stain of Trump. Exactly. Ron DeSantis. So, uh, well, DeSantis is absolutely coming out the winner in this, but it's the worst kept secret in D.C., at least in my circles, that they're... Republican operatives are hoping this top disqualifies Trump. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. You hear it left and right. Yep. Yeah. They want somebody else to do the work for them. Yeah. Correct. But it's like whether it's Mitch McConnell, whether it's there's a whole bunch of people that are hoping these hearings find the sweet spot of not harming the party, mm -hmm. but harming Trump. It's they hope so that in 2016, disgusting. too. It's so disgusting. This was a plot, an attempted coup on our democracy. It wasn't an attempted coup on Democrats. It wasn't an attempted coup on Joe Biden or Hillary Clinton. It was an attempted coup on our democracy. That is what is disgusting. And I go back to this point, and that's why people are so disagreed and disinterested in the political process, mm -hmm. because they are seeing what is happening here. And they, they are, they're watching this show, and they're hearing 
seeing people say, oh, well, you know, Republicans are hoping that this disqualifies Trump instead of them standing up and doing what folks like Tom Price and Liz But a him. little bit of optimism is that there apparently are more people paying attention to these hearings. And I think a lot, look, we were all cynics yeah. around this table. Yeah, I yeah. think we thought the country's tuning out. Mm -hmm. They've given up. Or they've made their decision. The good news right. is, is, you know, 20 million people means there's a lot of people out there who haven't given up. Yeah. Eugene, Simone, Jim. Thank you all. Terrific panel. Thank you all for being with us this hour. Back with more Meet the Press Now tomorrow. NBC News Now coverage will continue with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.